Let's turn to the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 35, which is an exposition of the Second Commandment. What doth God require in the Second Commandment? That we in no wise represent God by images, nor worship Him in any other way than He has commanded in His Word. Are images then not at all to be made? God neither can nor may be represented by any means. But as to creatures, though they may be represented, yet God forbids to make or have any resemblance of them, either in order to worship them or to serve God by them. But may not images be tolerated in the churches as books to the laity? No. For we must not pretend to be wiser than God, who will have his people taught, not by dumb images, but by the lively preaching of his word. The first and second commandments of God's law, beloved, may seem to be the same, but there is an important distinction. The first commandment answers this question. Whom? must we worship? And the answer is God alone, the one true and living God as he has revealed himself in the scripture is the only proper object of our worship. The second commandment answers a different question. How shall this one God be worshiped? And the answer is given first negatively, not by images, not by statues, not by idols, not by any representation of God or any representation of any creature upon the earth used to worship God. And the answer is second, positively, only as God himself has commanded in his word. Now this is a very topical subject, worship. And in many churches today, you will find that there is a war going on. We call that worship wars. There's a war going on within the congregation itself because the congregation is divided into two kinds of worshipers. And usually this divides along the generations. We have the older generation. And they are used to a certain kind of worship, traditional worship. That's the kind of worship that they want, and that's the kind of worship that they always have had. So they say, we want the old hymns, we want the traditional organ, we want solemnity, we want the minister to wear a dog collar, and so on and so forth. And then there is the younger generation growing up in the church, and they want contemporary worship. They want worship which is more exciting than these old, boring hymns, sung to old, boring hymn tunes on an old, dusty, and boring organ. And often, in these churches which are driven or divided by this worship war, a compromise has been reached. At nine o'clock, we will have our contemporary worship service which will please the young people. You can have your modern choruses and your youth band. And then at 11 o'clock we'll have another service which will be the traditional worship service. And that will please the old people. We will have the old fashioned hymns with the old tunes and the old organ. And this is supposed to be a solution to the worship war which is threatening to tear apart the church. But that compromise is a disaster for the church. It destroys the church's unity because now we have two churches within one congregation. We've got the older members, they meet at a certain time. You've got the younger members, they meet at a certain time. And often these members never really come together because they have nothing in common, they think. So you have young people's Bible studies and old people's Bible studies. And these generations in the church never learn from one another, which is what God intended when he brought the church together. The old can teach the young, and the young can also teach the old something about how to lead a Christian life. 
But the second commandment is the answer to worship wars in the church. Because the second commandment answers the question, how must God be worshipped? Shall God be worshipped in the traditional way, the way which pleases the old people? Or shall God be worshipped in a more contemporary way, the way which pleases the young people? And the answer is neither. Neither the old people nor the young people determine how God shall be worshipped. God determines how he shall be worshipped. God determines what is proper in the worship service. God determines what pleases him and what best edifies his people as they come together to worship God. Not man, not the young people, not the old people, not society, not the minister, not the elders, God, God alone. That's the essence of the second commandment. Notice then the proper worship of God. The proper worship of God. Notice first it is authorized, second it is edifying, and third it is spiritual. Worship to be acceptable to God must be commanded by God and therefore authorized by God himself. And the principle behind all biblical and reformed worship is this, the regulative principle of worship. The regulative principle of worship, which means God regulates his own worship. God commands how he shall be worshipped. God authorizes his own worship. Now that might sound radical to people today because the fact is that many churchgoers have never thought about worship in those terms. Churchgoers assume that when they meet together for worship that God must be pleased with their worship because after all they have made the effort to come to church. And surely God will be pleased with whatever they do in their worship service, as long as it is sincere. And if it makes the people feel good, isn't that also a good thing in the worship service? And so the attitude is, if it pleases us, then surely it will also please God. We are, after all, all sincere Christians. Will God not be pleased with our worship when we bring it sincerely? But the question is not, do we like it, or do others like it, or if we take a survey and ask the people on the street what kind of worship they would find attractive, what should we do? Or we've always been doing it this way since the 1700s or the 1600s, but what does God say in his word? Does the Bible teach that we may worship God however we choose, whatever way it takes our fancy, according to the majority of the people in the church, or what attracts most people to our worship services, which is the whole idea behind seeker-sensitive worship? Well, look at the Old Testament. God gave us, in the Old Testament, very detailed instructions on how he was to be worshipped. Read the book of Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, sections of those books and Exodus as well, and you will find chapter after chapter of detail after detail on how God is to be worshipped. So seriously did God take his worship in the Old Testament, and anyone who tried to introduce something else was severely punished by the Almighty. And is God any less strict in the New Testament? No. Jesus said we are to worship God in spirit and in truth. Paul warns against what he calls will worship in Colossians 2.23. Will worship is worship that comes out of the will of man, the heart and desire of man without any authorization from God. Let me illustrate briefly that this is reasonable, this idea of a regulative principle of worship whereby God himself determines how he shall be worshipped is reasonable. Let's say you wanted to throw a party for a friend. 
But instead of thinking about all the things that your friend likes to do and likes to have, you think about what you like to do and have. And so you cook all of those meals which are your favorite meals, but forget to realize that your friend doesn't like any of that food at all. And you hire a hall and you decorate it with your favorite colors, perhaps the colors of your favorite football team, and neglect to remember that your friend doesn't like sports. And you invite all of the people that your friend doesn't like, but they're your friends, and you have music that you like, your favorite music, but your friend doesn't like that music, and you play the games that you like to play, but your friend is not interested in playing. Someone who came to that party might legitimately ask the question, did you organize this party for your own pleasure or for the pleasure of the friend whose birthday you are celebrating? And if you listen to some people today describing their worship services, you might also legitimately ask this question. When you planned your worship service, did you take into account at all what God might want you to do? Or did you plan the worship service so it would please you in every particular? The regulative principle of worship is really quite simple. What God has commanded us to do in his word, we do. What God has forbidden us to do in his word, we do not do. And what God has not commanded us to do, we also do not do. And that third part is the essence of the regulative principle of worship. It's not just what God forbids we do not do, but also what God does not explicitly command us to do, we also do not do. And that makes sense as well, because the church is the house of God. And just as you determine how people behave in your house when they visit your house, you take off your shoes, for example, in some houses, that's required, or whatever. God determines how his people who come to his house to worship him on the Lord's day shall behave themselves during the worship service. And there's a whole New Testament epistle devoted to behavior in the house of God. It's 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy, the theme really is behavior, proper behavior in the house of God. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, 15. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and bride of the truth. That's really the purpose of Paul, by the inspiration of the Spirit, in writing 1 Timothy. So Timothy will know and be able to tell others as well how we are to behave ourselves, conduct ourselves in the house of God, which is the church of God. So we have in 1 Timothy instructions on worship, on prayer, for example, in chapter 2, and how men are to pray and women are to be silent. We are taught also in this book about office bearers, elders and deacons. We're taught about the calling of ministers to preach the gospel in season and out of season and to give themselves to reading and so on. The house of God then is not some kind of a free-for-all where everyone can do whatever he or she thinks should be done. But rather, everything must be done in accordance with the householder's wishes and commands. That is to say, God's word must dictate and determine what we do in the worship of his name. Now you might think that that means that we are severely restricted by this regulative principle of worship. There is no freedom whatsoever. It's all set down in stone, as it were. 
Well, the elements of worship are set down, as it were, in stone. What we include in the worship service is determined by God himself. But there are other general principles which are not set down in stone, which must be applied to the particular situation in which the congregation finds itself. To determine what shall be done in the worship service, you must look at the Word of God and see if you can find a command, an explicit command, to do something in the worship service. So, for example, we pray because the Bible commands that we pray. We read the Word of God, we hear preaching of the Gospel, and we sing. We take an offering and we use the sacraments. Those things are clearly set forth in the Word of God as elements of worship. Other aspects are up to the discretion of the local congregation and therefore the consistory of the local congregation. These would include things like time, order, and number. We meet on the Lord's Day, that is set forth in the scriptures, the first day of the week. What time? 9.30, 11, 12, 1. That is left up to the discretion of the local congregation. Now, of course, if the church decides we're all going to meet at 11, that means people should not turn up at 1 o'clock in the afternoon because there is no worship service there. It is expected that the congregation, therefore, will submit themselves to the wisdom of the elders to determine when the worship service shall take place. What about the order of worship? That, again, is not set forth explicitly in the Bible. How many psalms shall we sing during the worship service? One, two, three, seven. It's not set forth. How many times shall we pray? One congregational prayer, maybe two prayers. Shall we stand or shall we sit to pray? Those kind of things are not set forth explicitly in the Bible and are therefore free for the congregation to decide according to the wisdom that God gives the congregation and according to the best way that the congregation can be edified by these things. And with the regulative principle of worship, beloved, we honor God because we say God is wise enough, God is sovereign, and God is good to determine the best way in which he can be worshipped and the best way in which the church can be edified by that worship. Who better, therefore, to decide how God shall be worshipped than God himself. And when we introduce something into the worship of God, not explicitly set forth in the scripture, our own ideas, things that come from our own mind, our own imagination, then God will say, you are questioning my wisdom, as if I could not have thought of that part of worship being necessary for my people. And he will say to us, as he said to the people in Isaiah chapter 1, Who hath required this at your hand? Whose idea was to bring this into my worship? And so God is offended when we bring into his worship that which he has not commanded. Because we're saying, therefore, well, we thank God that we have some ideas that you might have forgotten about when you inspired the scriptures. We have ideas which are more relevant to our day, which will liven up the worship services of the church. No. God has determined, in his own wisdom, the best way to glorify himself through the worship of his people, the way that pleases him, and the best way in which his people are edified through public worship. And the bottom then, any innovation into the worship of God is pride. I know better than God how God should be worshipped. But the Heidelberg Catechism says that we are in no wise to represent God by images nor worship him in any other way than he has commanded 
in his word. And so we ought to examine the worship practices of the church. In the Old Testament, there are three outstanding examples of will worship. That is to say, worship introduced by the imagination of man without express commandment from God. There may be more, but here are three. First, Mount Sinai, the golden calf. Israel are waiting at the bottom of Mount Sinai. Moses is up there with God. He's going to receive express instructions on how to serve God from that mountain. And Israel are waiting down below. And they are becoming impatient. And they say to Aaron, make us gods. You could translate that, make us God, because the word Elohim is a plural word, which usually is translated God. Make us God. Make us the God who brought us up out of the land of Egypt. For as for this Moses, we do not know what has happened to him. And so their intention was not to replace Jehovah God with a different God. Their intention was to worship Jehovah God, the God who brought them out of Egypt by means of a visible calf, which they could then see, and their focus could be upon this, and they could use this as an aid in their worship. And Aaron, Moses' brother, complied with their wishes, and they made a golden calf. Something beautiful, a golden calf, and something majestic, a calf, one of the wonderful beasts of the field, and something they expected, therefore, would be honorable in the sight of God. And Aaron said, today is a feast day unto the Lord, or rather tomorrow is a feast day unto the Lord, and notice Lord Jehovah. So they're worshipping what they believe is Jehovah, or at least they're worshipping Jehovah through this calf. And they say explicitly that they're going to worship Jehovah by a feast on the next day. Now the question Aaron should have asked was this. Has God commanded us to make a golden calf? Now you could argue that they had not yet received the, the Ten Commandments and therefore they had not yet received the Second Commandment so God had not explicitly forbade them to make this golden calf. But the question is, had God commanded them to make a golden calf? And had God commanded them the next day to hold a feast unto Jehovah? No, he had not. He had simply said, wait for further instructions from my servant Moses, which he will receive at the top of Mount Sinai. That's what they should have done. Not set to inventing ways of worshipping God. The second outstanding example is found in Leviticus chapter 10. And let's turn to that very important chapter. Leviticus chapter 10. Tucked away in a whole list of different kinds of laws and ordinances, we have the history of Nadab and Abihu, and they were the sons of Aaron. In verse 1 of that chapter, we are told that they offered strange fire before the Lord. Now the text tells us what was strange about this fire. It was fire which God commanded them not. End of verse 1. Offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. That was what was strange about this fire. It was not explicitly commanded by God. Nadab and Abihu were priests. They were sons of Aaron. They were dressed in the correct priestly garments. They were at the correct place, the tabernacle. Yet their worship was rejected by God. And verse 2 says, There went out fire from the Lord and devoured them 
and they die before the Lord because of their presumption to offer fire which the Lord had not commanded after the Lord had given them detailed instructions on how to make and offer the incense in the tabernacle because of that God killed them they thought their way of being incense was just as good as the way God had given and therefore they were put to death by God himself much later we have the passage we read together earlier first Kings chapter 12 here we have the sad story of Rehoboam's foolish answer to the ten tribes bringing about a split a schism in the Old Testament church that of course did not justify what Israel did but it does explain what Israel did and so Israel the ten tribes of the northern kingdom rebelled against Rehoboam and the kings of David and Jeroboam saw this and he thought to himself you know the temple is in Jerusalem and the worship of God is done in Jerusalem and if I don't do something about it then my people will be tempted to go to Jerusalem and worship God there and then they will go back to the kings of David and then they will kill me and my kingdom will be destroyed so I will have to find some way of preventing them from going to Jerusalem and going back to the kings of David and here's what I will do I will consult with my advisors we are told that he took counsel verse 28 of first Kings 12 so he consulted with his advisors and they must have advised him therefore on this plan of action he made two calves of gold and he had the same rationale as Aaron and the people in Israel had way back in the wilderness he's not worshiping a different God oh no Behold, thy gods of Israel which brought the earth of the land of Egypt. He's worshipping Jehovah God through the golden calves. That's his rationale. And then to make it even surer, he puts one in Bethel at the bottom or the, the southern part of his kingdom and one in Dan, way at the north. And he says to the people, you know, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem that long and difficult pilgrimage to Jerusalem why put yourself through all of that effort here's a way to worship God which is much easier worship my golden calves because after all you're just worshiping the Lord in a different way and what would be the problem with that and the Bible says that was a sin and that sin continued throughout the entire history of the northern kingdom until that kingdom was destroyed by the Assyrian Empire. And notice too, he adds to his sin by making priests who are not of the sons of Levi. God said the priests shall be of the sons of Levi. He makes other kinds of priests. He makes a feast day, verse 32, in the eighth month, not the seventh month like it was in Jerusalem, the eighth month. And verse 33 says that this month he had devised of his own heart. This was the idea of Jeroboam, king of Nebat. Let's have a feast in the eighth month to mimic the feast that they have in the seventh month. And so he changes the worship of God. He changes the place, Jerusalem, to Bethel and Dan. He changes the manner of worship, sacrifices in the temple versus these two golden calves. He changes the time of worship, the eighth month instead of the seventh month. He changes the office bearers, priests of any of the tribes, but not Levi. And he changes every aspect of the worship just to make it different from the true worship of God but not too different so the people aren't too suspicious and his new worship was extremely successful almost everyone in the northern kingdom worshipped these golden calves and all of the kings of the northern kingdom 
continued this worship of the golden calves all the way to the destruction of that kingdom by the Assyrians. And this regulative principle of worship of it still applies today. And it judges all the worship of the churches of our day. And it finds much of the worship of the Christian churches to be found wanting. Because they cannot say that what they do is commanded in the word of God. And indeed what they do is offer strange fire before the Lord. Perhaps the most controversial part of this is singing. What shall we sing in the worship of God? There is a controversy in many churches today between the old traditional hymns of Wesley and Watts and so on and so forth, and the modern choruses with your guitar and your rock band and so on and so forth. How are we to decide which ones we are going to sing? And the answer is very simple. So simple that most people have never thought of it. The answer is, look in the Bible. What has God given us in the Bible to sing? The 150 Psalms of David. Here we have a perfect songbook, perfectly suited to the worship of God. Songs inspired by the Holy Spirit. And can you find in the Bible a command to write your own songs and add them to the 150 songs of David? I haven't found one. Can you find a command that says you should use the poems or songs of uninspired men and women and call those things hymns and then worship God by using those hymns? I cannot find one. And therefore, it would be intolerable presumption for us to say that we can produce better songs than the songs that the Holy Spirit himself has inspired in the Bible. But you say, but the Bible says we should sing hymns. Well, the question is, what does hymn mean in the New Testament scriptures? I'll just give one example of Mark 14, 26. Mark 14, verse 26. Jesus and his disciples have just celebrated the Last Supper, the first institution of the Lord's Supper. And it says in that verse, And when they had sung an hymn, they went out into the Mount of all. So my question is this, what hymn did Jesus and his disciples sing? It wasn't one of John Wesley's hymns, or Charles Wesley, or Isaac Watts. It wasn't a modern chorus either. It was a psalm. Because at the time of the Passover, the Jews traditionally sang, would sing some of the psalms. They called them the Hallel psalms. Certain songs of praise, such as 116. So the question is not, do you like traditional hymns? Or do you like the modern choruses? But when it comes to the public worship of God, which songs has God himself authorized that we sing? And this applies to all of the parts of the worship service. Without the regulative principle of worship guiding us in what we should do in the worship service, there is a constant tug of war between the old and the new generation, between the traditionalists on the one hand and the modernizers on the other hand. Let's take an example. Let's say someone wants to have a puppet show in the worship service. I don't think that's too far-fetched today either. Or to perform a sketch, or to have the minister stand up at the front dressed as a clown and juggle during the worship service. Let's say someone suggests that at the congregational meeting. Perhaps you say, but that's hardly fitting in the worship of God. To which I respond, says who? Says you? Says the minister? Says the elder? Says the deacon? 
What about the young people? Maybe they would like that. Perhaps I would attract more people to the worship services of the church. Shouldn't we make them less stuffy and less boring? Wouldn't that be good to have a clown and juggling in the worship service of God? And the answer is no, because God has not commanded us to have a clown and juggling in the worship of God. Sketches, puppet shows, fancy dress, juggling, None of those things are commanded in the Bible. And if you say, well, they're not fitting, but the Bible doesn't explicitly forbid them either, does it? So if you say, well, if it's forbidden, we will not do it, that's not strict enough, because you can get puppet shows through that crack if you say, only those things which are forbidden, we will not do. No, the principle is this. What is not explicitly commanded is also forbidden. And that's the only way to shut the door completely against innovations in the worship service. It's the end of all worship war. Because it's not that the old people win or the young people win. That the traditionalist gets his way, or the modernizer gets his way, or he makes some kind of compromise. But both of us, the modernizer and the traditionalist, the old person and the young person, all of us together bow down before the will of God and humble ourselves before God and look to God to tell us how he shall be worshipped. And this leads to mutual edification. All the people come together, the young and the old alike, worship God as he has commanded. God is glorified and God's people are edified. God is pleased. And that is the main point, remember, of the worship of God. Not that we are excited, necessarily, but that God is pleased. And if we find God's worship boring, and say, I wish we got more exciting things in our worship service, then we must ask God to change our heart and to ask God to forgive us for thinking that the worship of God is boring. The worship that God has commanded, the worship that God has designed for his own glory and for the good of his people is boring to you, you say. And that's a sin, a sin of the heart to think that. We ask God rather to change us and to cause us to be stirred in our hearts so we are not bored by the worship of God. But rather we are, we are thrilled to worship God as he has commanded that he be worshipped. That's the primary purpose in the worship of God, the glory of God. Whether we get anything out of it which is the cry we hear today in many churches. I didn't get anything out of that worship service today. What we do or not is secondary to that main purpose. But God in his mercy has also ordained worship so that it is edifying to God's people. To edify is to build. We get our word edifice from that word edify. A building. And the idea, therefore, is that it builds us up, it strengthens us, and it causes us to grow. An edification of God's people occurs through the preaching of God's Word, through being taught who God is. That's answer 98. We must not pretend to be wiser than God who will have his people taught. God will have his people taught, not entertained, but taught. They must be fed, therefore. They are like sheep who come hungry for green pastures. And God feeds them through the preaching of the word. That word is spiritual food to our souls. And the more we understand it, the more strong we become in our faith, the more we love God and hate our sin, and the more we hope for the coming of Jesus Christ. 
And all of that worship leads to the edification of God's people. When a man who is lawfully called by the church preaches the word of God in accordance with what the word of God actually says and is faithful to that word, God's people are built up. Without preaching, without teaching, God's church cannot be edified and God's people suffer. In fact, without preaching, God's church cannot survive. God preached in the Old Testament. Sometimes directly, he preached to Abraham, for example, directly, but often through mediators, through Moses, through the prophets and others. They preached. That was the way in which God's church was built up in the Old Testament. That didn't change in the New Testament. Jesus and the apostles came preaching. And after Jesus went back to heaven in the ascension, Jesus sent his apostles and gave teachers to the church and they continued to preach. And in every period of history when the church was strong, there was preaching. Much preaching, good preaching, faithful preaching. And when the church was weak, and when the church was falling away from the truth, there was weak preaching or no preaching. Think, for example, in the Middle Ages. What kind of preaching was there in the Middle Ages? Almost none. And the people were ignorant, and the people were not edified, and the pulpit failed. And today, we are seeing history repeat itself. Many churches, the people are woefully ignorant of the basics of Christian doctrine. Why? Because there's no preaching. There's no teaching. The people are not edified. The people are not equipped to live the Christian life because they are undernourished and well nigh starving. And the Reformation understood this and so they preached. They preached even when the people of God were not able to read the Bible for themselves because in those days there was little education. The people were illiterate and yet the reformers preached and people came to hear them in their droves. The reformers believed Romans 10 verse 17. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So they preached. They preached so the people would hear. And they preached so God would work faith in the people who would hear. And they promoted education too. So people could read. And read the Bible. And they translated the Bible into the language of the common people. So they could read it. And be edified by it. And better understand the preaching. And come better prepared to hear the preaching. And all the while the Roman Catholic Church opposed this. They wanted to keep the Bible in Latin and the worship services in Latin and keep the people ignorant because they had more power over the people if they were ignorant. And Rome's answer to preaching was, we don't need preaching. The people are ignorant. The people are illiterate. The people won't understand preaching or the Bible. We can teach them by images and by statues. That's why they call them, in the words of our Heidelberg Catechism, books to the laity. That was the view of Rome. Images are books to the laity. The laity are the common, unordained people of the church. You've got the priests and the bishops and so on, and then you've got the common people, and they're the laity. They need books, picture books, because they are so foolish, and so weak, and so Stupid, really, is what they would say. They don't need preaching. Only recently, the Vatican advised that sermons should be a maximum of eight minutes. Eight minutes. Because they said people can't listen to a long sermon, and after all, who needs preaching when we've got the Mass and all the other things in our worship service, which are much more visual, and they are the things that the people need when they hear the word of God. And the Church of England is going down the same road. They are saying we need to shorten our services and shorten our sermons because the people will not be able to listen for very long. 
The reformers said, however, no, we need preaching. We need detailed preaching. We need the minister to explain the text in detail. And that requires longer than 10 minutes. And the people got used to listening to preaching for a considerable period of time. But now, we've swung to the other side. People can't listen to preaching for longer than 15 minutes. And usually it's a story and a few little illustrations and no content whatsoever. And the people go home unedified. And what do images teach? Habakkuk 2 Verse 18 says that they are a teacher of lies. Images can teach us only one thing. Lies. They misrepresent who God is. And that's true for images in a Roman Catholic church. That's true for pictures in storybooks of God or Jesus. That's true of statues. That's true of any kind of visual aid used in the worship service. They teach lies. Only the other day, I saw an old church, and there were various pictures around the walls which were depicting what happened at the cross. There was one picture of Jesus, and there were angels gathered around him, and they were capturing the drops of blood that fell from him in a golden cup. And that was to perpetuate the lie of transubstantiation. Another picture showed Jesus in the arms of his mother as he was taken down from the cross. More lies. There's nothing in the Bible that says that. Joseph of Arimathea took down Jesus from the cross. The women, and if Mary was there, we aren't even told, the women watched from afar. All those kinds of pictures tell lies about who God is and who Jesus is. Films like the Jesus film and the Passion of the Christ, again, lies. Because they cannot depict who Jesus is, because Jesus is more than just a mere man. You can't depict the divinity of Jesus Christ by a movie. The true worship of God is edifying and God glorifying because it is Christ centered and especially because it is centered on Christ crucified. That was the heart of all acceptable worship in the Old Testament and when someone came to God in a different way they were implicitly if not explicitly rejecting Christ and him crucified. Think, for example, of Cain, way in the beginning of the Old Testament. He worshipped God by bringing his sacrifice of vegetables. Rejected, Christ crucified, unlike Abel. What about Nadab and Abihu? Well, they rejected Christ crucified too because the incense, which was mixed with the coals from the altar of burnt offering, was a picture of the crucifixion of Christ and the ascension, or rather the intercession of Christ based upon that crucifixion. They took their incense from some other place and thus bypassed or rejected Christ crucified. The Israelites also rejected that Christ-centered worship when they made a golden calf and ignored Moses, who was the mediator, a picture of Jesus Christ, and did not come to God in the way that God commanded by means of sacrifices of blood. He rejected Christ crucified. So did Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. He rejected the line of David. He rejected the proper sacrifices in the Jerusalem temple. All of those things are types and shadows of Jesus Christ and him crucified. And that's the way our worship must be as well centered on Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Our prayers are in the name of Jesus Christ. The psalms which we sing are about Jesus Christ. Every psalm proclaims Jesus Christ. The Word of God we read, Jesus Christ and Him crucified is in the text. 
Every sermon we hear has Jesus Christ and Him crucified at the center of it. He is the center of every worship service and the only way in which we can come to God and be approved and accepted by Him. Which is why, of course, all kinds of ecumenical worship between various kinds of Christians and false religions are an abomination to God because they leave out Christ crucified. They will not come in the name of Jesus Christ, but rather they come in the name of some vague God. And the more we learn about Christ crucified, the more we are edified, and the more God is glorified, because God is the one who determined Christ crucified as the only way of salvation for his elect people. Why fundamentally are images forbidden in the worship of God? Because God is spiritual. God is spiritual. That's our hyperbole catechism. God neither can nor may be represented by any means. God is a pure spirit, invisible, without form or shape or color, not made up of any kind of physical stuff, immaterial. God is spiritual. And he fills heaven and earth with his glory. So how could any image even begin to like him? And so the golden calf, as glorious a piece of art as it may have been, you can imagine a calf, golden, shining in the sun. But how can gold, even polished gold, even come close to the majesty and glory of God? And a calf, even if you took the most majestic animal of the field, how could that even come close to depicting our glorious God is. God is insulted by anyone who attempts to make a picture of him or to devise any image of him because it's infinitely lower than who God actually is. And the same is true for Jesus Christ, our Savior. As I said, you cannot depict Jesus Christ. We don't know what he looked like when he walked upon the earth, we have no description of him in the Bible. What color his eyes were, what color his hair was, what color his skin was, how tall he was, what build he had. We have no idea about those things. And even if we did, we can't depict his divine majesty, which was veiled behind his flesh. And so we don't look to dumb that is to say, images that cannot speak, we look to the living God, who has spoken to us in his word, through Jesus Christ. And we ask him, Lord, how would you have us worship thee? And he answers us very clearly, do exactly as I have said to you in my word. Then, your worship will be acceptable to me. Through Jesus Christ, who died on the cross to purify even your worship. For Christ's sake. Amen. 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 Our Father in heaven, thank thee that we have the privilege of worshiping thee, and that thou hast given unto us thy word. So we do not have to crawl around in the dark and wonder how we are to worship this great God who has made the heavens and the earth. Sanctify our worship, Father, by thy spirit and through the blood of thy Son. For we confess that we may do all the things outwardly which seem to be pleasing unto thee, but our hearts are so often far away from thee. Forgive this too in the blood of thy Son. For Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. Amen.